Welcome to Talking Business, your straight-talking guide to dealing with corporate matters. Whether you are a private or public company, an owner-managed business or an entrepreneur, a director, company secretary or in-house counsel, this is the podcast for you. My name is Sophie Brooks and I'm a partner in our corporate team. I was a transactional lawyer for a number of years before becoming a professional support lawyer, which means I'm now responsible for know-how across our corporate team. Each month, I'll provide an update on the latest developments that matter to you, and we'll be joined by an expert to take a deep dive into a key corporate law topic. Hi everyone, Uh, I've just got a pretty quick update for you uh, this month. Um, In a moment, we'll look at some new rules for authorised firms that are approving or wanting to approve financial promotions issued by unauthorised persons. Um, But first up, I thought we'd have a look at a case uh, involving a loan agreement between a lender and a football club, where the court said that actually that loan agreement had been novated to the club's majority shareholder. And that meant that the shareholder and not the football club was liable for the outstanding balance. So I mentioned novation there. So what is novation? Well, uh, novation of a contract takes place where the relative parties basically agree that an existing contract is replaced by a new one. So typically, It occurs where, let's say we've got a contract between A and B, and that's replaced by a contract between A and C, with C assuming B's rights and obligations under that original contract. So remember, one of the uh, uh, elements that we need present to have a binding contract is that there has to be consideration moving between the parties. And in this case, consideration with a novation is provided by the discharge of the old contract. So specifically, A agreeing to release B, B providing C in its uh, place, and then C agreeing to be bound by A. So effectively, we go from having a contract between A and B to the same contract, but between A and C with B dropping out of the picture altogether. So when you're doing that, when you're replacing that contract between A and B with one between A and C and and B is being released, you need the agreement of all the parties uh, involved, A, B and C. And that consent could be provided expressly. So the parties could very clearly expressly agree to it, or it could just be inferred from the conduct of the parties. And if when we're talking about the consent, The consent doesn't have to actually be in writing and whether or not it has been provided is just going to be a question of fact uh, on all the uh, evidence. So that's what a novation is. So in in relation to how it cropped up in this particular case. So we had a a lender who'd made a loan of £350,000 to Oldham Athletic Football Club and the loan was secured by a debenture granted by the club in favour of the lender. So the club's uh, chair, and who was also the, the um, club's majority shareholder, began negotiations for the sale of the club. And as part of that, there were discussions about the satisfaction of the debt owed by, uh, owed by the club to the lender. Now, the judge in this case said, that the the chair, who remember is negotiating the sale, has a very close connection with the lender. So a crucial piece of evidence here is that there was a letter sent from the lender and addressed to the chair at the club, stating that the lender had made an agreement with the chair and that on completion of the sale of the club, the debenture with the lender will be satisfied personally by the chair. So after all of this and after the club's been sold, the lender seeks repayment of the outstanding balance of the loan from the club. But the club argues that actually the loan agreement between the lender and the club had been novated to the chair as evidenced by that letter that I mentioned. So the club argued It had been released from its obligation to repay the loan and it was no longer liable to the lender under the loan agreement. But the lender argued that the agreement hadn't been novated 
and that actually what the chair had been doing was just agreeing to pay the club's liability on its behalf rather than actually assuming all of its obligations under the loan agreement. So when this came before the court, the judge agreed with the club. The judge said it was clear from the surrounding evidence that the potential sale of the club was proceeding on the basis that the chair would be satisfying the debt to the lender personally. And it was against that particular background that the letter had been written. So when you looked at that letter, the uh, court said that the agreement embodied in it amounted to an express novation of the debt from the club to the chair. There was an express agreement that on completion of the sale of the club, the club's liability was immediately discharged and the chair assumed that liability. And that express agreement had been made by the chair in the letter in a dual capacity, um, acting both personally and also acting on behalf of the club. So we'd got, if you like, we've got our A, B and C that I was talking about earlier. We've got the lender, the chair and the club. Um, so, as I say, that was a tripartite agreement between the original contracting parties, the lender and the club, and the new contracting party, the chair. It had been supported by consideration in the form of the chair's personal assumption of the liability for the debt, and therefore the loan agreement had been validly novated. So, the judge dismissed the lender's claim against the club. It basically said, you haven't got any claim against the club, you might have a claim against the chair. So um, we're, we're talking about a transfer of a contract here and when parties want to transfer a contract they're usually faced with a choice of either assigning their rights under that contract or else novating it entirely and the requirement for the other contract party to consent to any novation means really that that route is pretty rare in practice because basically it gives the other party the opportunity to renegotiate the contract on more favourable terms in return for giving their consent to the no novation. So basically, if you go to them and ask for a novation, they're going to ask, well, what's in it for me? And try and renegotiate the terms more favourably. So I think this case is a, a useful reminder, both <laughs> of the requirements for a novation and also, and I would say this because I'm a lawyer, the advantages of ensuring that parties' intentions are always accurately recorded in writing. Okay, so then the other thing that I just thought I would mention is that the FCA has published a policy statement about its new rules affecting authorised firms, so firms that are authorised to conduct business by the FCA, um, that want to approve financial promotions issued by unauthorised persons. So what's a financial promotion? Well, that is a communication by someone acting in the course of business, which is an invitation or inducement to engage in investment activity. And it includes um, formal documents, so things like a prospectus or an information memorandum about a company. But then it also includes more kind of informal communications about investment activity. So things like uh, those TV or uh, radio adverts that you hear, social media promotions, an awful lot of those around, aren't there? Telephone calls, that kind of thing. They're all, if they are encouraging investment activity, they're all financial promotions. So the current restriction on issuing a financial promotion means that it can only be done by a person who's authorised by the FCA to carry on investment activity or where an authorised person has approved the content of the financial promotion or if one of all the relevant exemptions applies. So if you haven't got an exemption, your financial promotion either needs to be made by an authorised person or if it's made by an unauthorised person, the content has to be approved by an authorised person. But the FCA has become concerned that there are too many non-compliant financial promotions being approved by authorised persons, but then being communicated by unauthorised persons. And according to the FCA in 2022, over eight and a half thousand promotions had to be amended or withdrawn 
because they failed to adequately identify relevant risks. And according to the FCA, that means that consumers have been harmed when they've relied on these financial promotions, but the underlying products have been inappropriate for them and have maybe not matched their attitude to risk. So what's changing? Well, basically, from the 6th of November, firms that want to be able to approve financial promotions on behalf of unauthorised people will need to apply to the FCA's new gateway for permission to do that. Now, provided they have applied before the deadline of 6 of February 2024, so 6 of February next year, they will continue to be able to approve financial promotions for unauthorised persons until their application is determined. But any firm that has not applied for permission by the time that initial application window closes on the 6th of February, will need to stop approving financial promotions for unauthorised persons from that date. So um, in relation to the application that you have to make on the gateway, that has to indicate how many promotions the firm expects to approve and the revenue it expects to generate from doing so. It also needs to explain what expertise it has to approve the type of promotions for which it's applying for approver permission. And the FCA has indicated that that's going to be one of the key factors that they're going to look at when assessing an application for permission. And so, for example, it's not going to uh, expect or indeed approve a firm that, say, only has consumer credit permissions um, if they're applying for permission to approve promotions relating to, say, investment in shares, because the FCA is going to say, well, you haven't got the appropriate um, expertise to understand and uh, approve that type of financial promotion. Um, there are some exceptions. So uh, an authorised person won't need to apply for permission if the person approves its own promotions for communication by an unauthorised person. So what that's aimed at is, for example, an authorised person whose content is advertised in a newspaper or on social media. So the um, the, the newspaper owner, the social media platform, that uh, isn't an authorised person, but the, we have an authorised person who is just using it to communicate their own promotion. That's OK. Um, also, you don't need permission if the person is approving a financial promotion on behalf of an unauthorised member of its group. So basically, you're looking at a big group of companies. One of them is authorised. It can issue um, without uh, uh, permission and or a financial promotion by another unauthorised member of its group. And then finally, uh, you don't need permission if the person approves as principal a promotion that's made by its appointed representative in relation to a regulatory activity for which the authorised person has accepted responsibility. So um, obviously uh, what the FCA is hoping for here with this uh, new regime is that there's going to be a, a much higher degree of compliance with its financial promotion rules, that that's going to lead to a generally raised standard of, of those promotions. And it believes that in turn, that is going to ensure that consumers themselves are protected and they're able to help themselves more when interacting with financial services. So that's it for this month. Uh, uh, quite a quick one. Hope you enjoyed that and I'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to Talking Business. To find out more about the series, please visit gatelyplc.com slash talkingbusiness. From there, you can subscribe for all updates, meet our speakers and get more information on all of the topics being discussed.